I'm going to start out with a question, and the question is, what do we have in salvation in Christ? What do we have in salvation? What does that mean to you? What has God given you through the act of salvation, a relationship with Jesus Christ? What have you been given? Mary. All right, confidence that we know we're going to spend eternity with the Lord. Ruth. Forgiveness, we have forgiveness. Tricia. Peace, certainly do. Brother Steve. What's that? Cleansing, we have cleansing. The cleansing power of the blood. Mary. We have joy. We certainly, well, we should have joy, right? I know Brother Ken mentioned that, you know, it's the Old Testament, sometimes dark and dreary. Sometimes Baptists are dark and dreary, too. Anyway, I'm just pointing that out. We do have joy. That is part of the, that's part of the package. So what do we have in salvation? Brother Bob, a new life. I don't, I was, I was thinking about salvation for myself this last week, just kind of meditating on God's word, and as I was walking through that, I actually don't know where I'd be today if I didn't have Christ as my Savior. I really don't. Maybe I'd be a millionaire. Maybe I'd be a billionaire. Maybe I'd be a criminal. Maybe I'd be in prison. I know there's, there's times we go, if I wasn't saved, I'd be in prison. And for some people, that's absolutely true. I might be doing great. I might have a way better, I'm saying better as in temporally speaking, better life. I may have it way easier. I may have it a ton easier. This side of heaven. But man, when I think about that new life I have, uh, I have a good marriage. I have good kids. I have good friends. I trust my friends. I trust those I'm around. That new life that we have in Christ should not be overlooked. That what we have in him really matters this side of heaven also. What, do we, what else do we have in salvation? Laura. A no so. We're sealed. We're sealed under the day of redemption. You know, it's, it's going to be there until we, did you have one? Or we, reconciliation. It, it's, it's very hard to believe that the creator of the universe reconciled unto us. No particular, I mean, didn't have to. He just loved us that much. What else do we have? Brother Kimmel. We're a joint heir. Christ, joint heir. If my mic's cutting out, I just caught something. Just let me know. I can go by the pulpit. I heard a little jump. So uh, We're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. I get in. I mean, can you imagine, I don't know, rich Uncle Larry over there? I don't know. He's, he's worth billions over there. And then I know, like, he's planning on giving it to his kids. But one day I get to be joint heir with Aaron, and I get to be part of the billion-dollar fortune that Brother Larry has. That'd be pretty remarkable. Well, if Larry is as rich as he is, and how odd that would be for me to be a joint heir. When you're a joint heir with Christ, I certainly don't deserve to be in on that family. And then I get to be a partaker of the riches that Christ has? That's fantastic. What else do we have in salvation? Well, I love Matthew 3, 33, so God has overcome the world. I don't have to overcome the world. Yeah, we have, uh, he's overcome the world, and so henceforth, we don't have to, I think uh, it was David Gibbs years ago, he preached on the tribulum. Don't be a grump, if you remember that message. I don't know, it was way back in the auditorium. It was way, way back. But Brother Tory. Victory over sin, conditional. The other thing is if you can be the friend of Christ if you abide in him. If you follow his commandments, you can be his friend. It's a conditional promise, right? What else do we have? Brother Ken. A new heart. Imagine that. Because my heart was pretty wicked before that. That transformation that we have. Mrs. Ingalls. He will never leave us nor forsake us. And it's for our good, even when you're going through the tough times. No one's mentioned it yet. We're not going to hell. I wouldn't want to spend a second down there. There are people that are going to spend an eternity. Their only reprieve is when they deal with the later judgments and then they go right back into the lake of fire. I, I don't have to deal with any of that. Salvation in Christ means I don't have to spend one moment in hell. I don't have to spend one moment 
separated from God. And then what's the benefit? If there's a positive, if there's a negative thing that we're avoiding, what's the positive that we get? Heaven. We get heaven. There's a mansion being prepared for us in heaven. What do we get in heaven? New body, new mind, new, I mean, so, and I, I don't want to exhaust it because we do have to get to the scriptures, but how much do we get in salvation? It, it's like the whole, the whole nine yards, right? It's the whole kit and caboodle. It's, the, it's everything. It's the reconciliation. It's the, it's forgiveness. It's joy. It's the rest of the fruit of the spirit. It's a new mind. It's a new life. It's a new heart. It's new this, this, and that. We get all this stuff, and how much did we earn of it? None of it. Because salvation is of the Lord. Salvation's of the Lord. It's what it says in Jonah, and I, I like that idea that salvation's of the Lord. Salvation's not of me. It's of God. And because it's of God, his gift is perfect unto us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's this massive gift we have in salvation. And so when we talk about the immensity of salvation, when we read these next five verses, consider that, and then we'll, we'll walk through these. So let's read those first five verses. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, he is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whosoever keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. Those are some tremendous verses, so let's walk through it. We're going to be kind of seeing a balancing truth. The first two verses, we're going to see we're going to see this relationship with God played out in two different ways. First of all, we're going to see him as our, uh, as our advocate. We're going to see him as our advocate. Then we're going to see that he's the propitiation for our sins. And then we're going to get this expectation about how we're going to live life. So let's walk through that. So the apostle, in verse number one, refers to his readers, my little children. Now, could he literally be talking to little children? I mean, he could literally be talking to little children, but what is it more likely referring to? Spiritual, spiritual kids, right? So you get this kind of spiritual idea. So he could be referring to little children. By the way, that would be the greatest children's book of all time. Way better than anything Dr. Seuss wrote. Anyway, uh, the term could be referring to small children, but here undoubtedly he's using a spiritual sense. He refers either to those young in the Lord or whom he as an elderly apostle had helped disciple because these books, they're not the, it's not the last book that's written, that's Revelation, but these are one of the last epistles that's written. First, second, third John are some of the last books in the Bible that are written. And so by contrast, uh, they were young children to him. It's funny when Brother Kimmel mentioned Karen, what did he refer to her as? A young lady. And why is she a young lady? Because she was five years younger than him. Like, it's a funny way to put it, right? And so we view people who are younger than us as being young, so perhaps that's his perspective because John would have been quite old when he wrote this. So he writes it, uh, and by the way, this is the first of nine uses, first of nine uses of little children throughout this epistle. One major purpose of the writing of the epistle was in order that they sin not. So the goal is, hey, he's teaching them how to work through life. So though technically not imperative, actually in the, in the Greek, it's actually in the subjunctive mode, the thought clearly carries a force of imperative. Does God want us to live holy? Is holy a curse word? I know it's four letters, but it is not a curse word. Today, the word holy, living holy, is viewed as being like, ah, that's old-fashioned. It is not old-fashioned. It is biblical. And we should live a life that is pleasing unto God and should live holy. All God's people said amen. So we get this. Anyway, so however, if 
If and when a child of God does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. That's an interesting word, advocate. It's an advocate. I write unto you, my little children, you sin not. And if we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father. So what do we think of when we hear the term advocate? We think of a lawyer, right? And what does a lawyer do? Defends us. So we think of a trial lawyer, he's in front of the judge and he's trying to defend us and all that. Now how much can we defend ourselves? Imagine us before God defending ourselves. How good would that be? How well does it work for someone who doesn't know the law to defend themselves? Is it ever a good idea for someone to defend themselves in front of a, in front of a judge? And by the way, can an earthly judge be fooled? Can an earthly judge be bamboozled? Can an earthly judge make mistakes? But our Father in heaven, he's the perfect judge. Part of who he is, part of his being. It's, it's one of his virtues. And so our God is just. Can you pull the wool over God's eyes? The answer is, no, you can't. So henceforth, no human with their weak and frail being could pull the wool over God's eyes. But we have someone who can advocate for us. And who is it? It's Jesus Christ. And when Jesus advocates for us, how is he advocating for us? Is it because he goes, you know what? Chris Peppard, he's a super guy. You just don't see it the right way. He's, he's better than you think. Is that what Jesus Christ is doing? Is he going, Chuck Van Densen, super guy. He tithes most of the time. He's one of the best tithers in the church. He's a super guy. I know he makes mistakes. I'm assuming he tithes, by the way, so if he doesn't, it's really awkward. So anyway, Janine Musa, she helps in the print shop. Fantastic human being. How is Jesus Christ defending us in front of, in front of the judge? Brother Steve. Yeah. What is, how does that verse end? Jesus Christ the what? The righteous. Who is he pointing to? Who is he advocating? They're good? Not because Joe Zek is good. It's not that Joe's done anything. It's that Jesus Christ has done something. He's advocating himself, which is an unusual thing. Can you imagine the defense lawyer going, look, my client is a total idiot. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's, he's, and if, and if you're not supposed to use that term in front of children, I'm so sorry that I'm teaching your children those words like that. He's not a very smart human being. That's the phrase you're supposed to use. It's like when my wife's like, where did you learn that language? And I'm around my kids and like, we learned it from their grandpa. Anyway, um, I have some stories. But when you think of this this advocate here, he's advocating for us, and it's him. It's Christ the righteous, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he's doing that. So that's great. We're, we're, we've heard sermons on that. We've heard that talked about. The word advocate is very interesting. The word advocate is also translated differently in, let's say, John, the epistle. It's also translated as comforter. It's the word paraclesis. It's the paraclete. It's, it's the Holy Spirit. Uh, we get to see that it's used as comforter. And we get to see this kind of this play on words here. Uh, it is interesting, but here, this idea, this advocate, this comforter, is directly applied to Jesus Christ. And that word has the idea of comfort. How many lawyers make you feel comfortable? How many lawyers give you real hope? How many defense attorneys do you go, man, I love those defense attorneys. I love seeing those ads. Those guys all look like stellar human beings. They look like they got, they got the best intentions out there. What's the goal for a defense attorney? Make money. That is why they're in business, right? Let's just be honest. If they say they're willing to wait till after you get your settlement to get paid, that must mean they're going to get paid a lot. <laughs> What's the job of a defense attorney? Give you the least amount of punishment possible? Hopefully maybe get you off the charges and all that. 
Jesus Christ, with this parallel of the Holy Spirit, kind of seeing those words being used, what's Jesus Christ's goal in defending you? Chris. Impute his righteousness. And imputation means that he puts his righteousness right over you. He doesn't want to just get you out of those charges. What does he want you to do? Go to heaven. That defense attorney has the best in mind for you. He gets nothing out of the deal except another person to worship him. He gets nothing. I mean, he doesn't have to do any of this, but he does it because why? Because he loves. The, the goal, the motivation is not financial. It's love. That is a way better motivator than the guy who's just doing it for a few bucks. And the best that a defense attorney can do is just get you out of some trouble. But Jesus Christ isn't just getting you out of trouble. He's getting you into heaven. It's a way better, it's a way better system. So we get to see that he's this advocate. Well, where does that lead to? It leads to verse two. And he is what? The propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Propitiation harkens back to the mercy seat in the Jewish tabernacle or the temple and there once a year on the day of atonement, the high priest would sprinkle the blood of the sin offering and, and, the people, and his people was propitiated. The idea is that God was appeased or satisfied with the blood that was shed. The blood that was shed. The same word is used in Romans 3.25 referring to Jesus Christ, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith uh, in his blood. Jesus Christ, God's son, is a propitiation for our sins. That is, he, through his own shed blood, has satisfied the righteous demands of a holy God that sin be judged. Satisfied it. Satisfied it. Without the, without the payment of sin, without the payment, without the blood sacrifice, where were we headed to? Hell. And how bad is hell? It's awful. Now, do we deserve hell? I mean, that, that's a very tough subject to, to mention, right? It's not, it's not what everyone wants to talk about. It's not a very happy subject. But hell is reality. Without Jesus Christ, without the relationship with him, without his blood being shed for us, without asking for that salvation, we have hell lined up for us. And hell is described as what in the New Testament? Lake of fire? Darkness? Where the worm dies not? It's eternity without God? You think this world's bad now? Wait till the Holy Spirit gets out of here. You think life is bad now, even for the atheist? Wait till they're in a godless hell. There is a punishment for our sin. There is a day of reckoning for our sin. All these things. And here Jesus Christ comes and he says, my blood is sufficient. The sprinkling of my blood, the shedding of my blood is sufficient. He is the propitiation. So not only does he advocate, he also sacrifices for us that propitiation. And who did he die for? The whole world, which pushes right into the face of those who say Christ only died for some people. Limited atonement. By the way, it's the weakest of those doctrines in TULIP is limited atonement. Christ died for the sins of the entire world. How do I know? It says it right there. The whole world. Can you get around the term the whole world? It's right there. And when you go, well, you know, we don't actually know if Christ died for Rachel. We actually don't know if Christ died for, Christ died for you. <laughs> I want to repeat it. Like, Christ died for you. Christ died for you. So on the cross, he had your specific name on his mind. All the things Jared Longsign did from 1978, 1988. How about that? I'm getting too old. The, I want to start moving that date up a little bit. From 1978 all the way to 2000 and. 2002, all those sin that I had, I'd add up, I mean, just piles of sin. When I accepted Christ, my Savior, those were all gone. But you know what else? 
all the sin from 2002 and on, those were paid for also. All the sin that you've ever committed, every single one, if I were to point at each one of you and started going, your sin, your sin, your sin, from the moment you were born to the moment you take your last breath, that's all paid for. The propitiation of the whole world. Is that a lot of sin? You could have truckloads of sin just in this room, just in the pew that Brother Dave Borley's sitting in. And he's like a super good guy. That's what we'd say, oh, but Brother Borley's a good guy. He's a dirty, rotten, filthy sinner, deserved hell. And yet, here the advocate comes and goes, look, Dave, you're going straight to hell. The devil says it. Can't argue with the charges. They're absolutely correct, but I got good news. The advocate shed his blood for you. And you get an entrance into his kingdom. Doesn't get any gooder than that. Great. So we see that we have this, the sins of the whole world. You see this pushback. The fact that, and I'm going to repeat the phrase, that through his own shed blood has satisfied the righteous demands of a holy God that sin be judged. His blood overcame that. So since we get to see that Christ is our advocate and Christ is our propitiation, we also know that Christ is knowable. He's knowable. He wants us to know him. Verse 3, and hereby we do know that we know him. That's a very funny phrase. We do know that we know him. Comma, and then here it is. Here is this condition. It says what? If we keep his commandments. Why is it so important in order to know Jesus Christ that we have to keep his commandments? In John chapter 14, it says, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 15, if you're my friend, keep my commandments. And Brother Chris, he said something. Relationship. Uh, I am married, if you didn't know been married for a while. I'm planning on doing it for a while longer. I'm married. Do I want to know more about my wife or less about my wife? If I truly love her. Is my wife, is she fully, is she fully noble by me and by now? Am I going, you know what, I've been married to her for about 20 years. I, I don't know. What other questions could you find out? How much more is there to explore? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I already know what restaurant she likes. I know what I know how to annoy her. I know all those things. What, what possibly could there be? I don't need to talk to her for three years. I'd still be okay. She'd be okay. I wouldn't. But anyway, it's a relationship. So Christ is asking us to keep his commandments. Why do we need to keep his commandments? Brother Dave. Brother Dave. I'm sorry, I misheard. Yeah, if you're not in a continual relationship, you start having doubts. If I didn't tell my wife over and over that I loved her, do you think eventually she may not believe that I love her or maybe that I've fallen out of love, whatever that means? That's a whole different sermon, but that's not happening today. Keep a vibrant relationship. Why else should you keep commandments? Your testimony. Mary? Lord will bless you. All right. Does Christ have the best in mind for me? It is everything he commands for my betterment? Everything he does. All right. So everything he's commanded, and by the way, it's actually quite simple. All you have to do to follow the commandments of Christ is love God and love people. And if you can do that, you're good. That's all you have to do. I mean, super simple, right? Because you always love God, as Brother Kimmel mentioned. All you have to do is love God with what, how much? All your heart. I mean, that's super simple. And then just love your neighbors yourself. I mean, super to love your, I mean, super easy to love your neighbors. I mean, you guys get along famously too. So, I mean, no big deal. That is sarcasm, by the way, if you guys were curious. 
It is very difficult to be a Christian anyway. But so if you're just to take those two commandments, but breaking them apart and you start seeing how this plays out, what kind of things is Jesus Christ asking you to do? Things he was willing to do. Did he wash the disciples' feet? So henceforth, what do we know? That we should serve other people. Are we supposed to lay down our life for the brethren? And you can start naming these commandments, but when you start doing each one of those things, what do you actually find out you're becoming more like? Christ. Christ. Uh, Have you ever played a sport? It is one thing to go through practice. It's one thing to practice. It's another thing to even sit on the bench and you watch the other. It's another thing to hear the parents on the side like, I don't know why that kid did that. That was one of the dumbest things ever. I don't know why that. If I was out there, do you know what I'd do? Look worse. That's what you'd do. (laughs) To be a practicing Christian And when I say practice, I mean there's something about observing Christianity. There's something about reading about Christianity. But it's another thing actually to be in the ball game, to actually be involved in a mission trip when you're exhausted and you're praying for God to give you the power to go that extra mile. To go, and sometimes it's literally an extra mile if you're on a courier's trip. Can I hand out one more hour of scriptures? Can I hand out, how much more can I fit into a backpack? I'm tired. How much more can I deal with because I'm exhausted spiritually? Uh, it's another thing to work in, uh, work in a ministry with difficult people, and you keep working through it. But the more you follow his commandments, the more you follow it, the more you're going to know him because you know what he's like. You know what he thinks. In order for you to know more about God and have that confidence about God, you have to be in the same lane that he's in. When people, when people who don't go to church, when people who don't read their Bible, they give some quote from the Bible out of context and they act like they know Christ more than we do, I, I kind of laugh to myself. You don't know Christ until you're keeping his commandments. You're never going to know Christ sufficiently until you start keeping his commandments and you start getting into the game. You have to be an active Christian in order to find out what he likes. Just like if you're married. The only way to have a vibrant relationship with your spouse is to be engaged in the process, to keep keep that relationship going, to keep asking questions, to keep finding out more what she or he likes and working through that process. People want to think they know God because they read the Bible once. That is not sufficient. It's a continual, ongoing lifestyle that you live, and the more you do it, the more you keep his commandments, the more you're going to know him and have confidence. So let's look at that phrase again. And hereby, we do know that we know him. Is that a confident statement? I hope you can say, I know him. I know him. We do know him. And we know him. And hereby, we do know that we know him. That's a great confident statement. Because why? Because of the condition that's set on it, if we keep his commandments. And here, John, as the, epi- as the apostle, he did. He had that confidence. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day you've given us. We thank you for what we have in Jesus Christ, our advocate, the propitiation for our sins. What a magnificent truth it is that we have someone who loves us so much. He didn't just get us, quote unquote, out of trouble. He gave us something better. He gave us absolute victory that one day that as this old frail body falls apart and it fails, that we'll take our last breath and we will wake up with our eyes open, refreshed, renewed, and in the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What a precious truth that is. And because of that, we have, I don't know if it's obligation, but certainly out of adoration, an opportunity to serve him, to keep his commandments, to be pleasing unto him. Help us to balance the truth of what we've received freely in Jesus Christ by a work ethic that shows that we're grateful for what we've been given. And Lord, we do love you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.